Amen. So Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, you could uh, entitle this, Haters Gonna Hate, because uh, that's what's happening here in Nehemiah 6. He is the object of a lot of opposition in this uh, particular chapter. A few weeks ago, we talked about how Christian discipleship, to use the language of, of Eugene Peterson, involves a long obedience in the same direction. Um, and we're seeing that now, Nehemiah being obedient, pressing on in the face of opposition, and uh, we too will face opposition, won't we? And so we have a lot of wisdom to glean from this chapter. So let, let's pray together and ask for the Lord to teach us from his word. Father, we know that the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of God stands forever. What a gift it is to have the Bible. Would that the whole world could read it and would embrace it and believe it. We believe, Father, that you are infinitely wise and infinitely good, and we would be a fool not to listen to you. So we pray you would come and humble us, quiet our souls, come and feed us as hungry children. You are our highest good and our greatest joy. Now come and minister to us, we pray, in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. So I got really excited singing uh, Mighty Fortress is Our God, uh, one of my favorite hymns. Some of you probably know that in about two weeks we will recognize the 500th year of the Protestant Reformation which is uh, typically given the date October 31st, 1517. Though there were many important events leading up to that, and though that actual date is somewhat disputed, uh, that's the date we typically give to uh, the time in which Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg. His, not 95 Reeses, um, 95 theses. I could think I could eat 95 Reeses right now. Um, but that was the time in which Luther was protesting what the church was teaching, particularly about salvation. And he re restored to the church uh, the gospel. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And uh, Luther uh, has had, obviously, a tremendous impact, not just on the church, but the whole world in various ways. And some people have wondered, is there any connection between Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Luther, given that they have the same name? And, uh, and the answer is yes. In 1934, Michael King went to the Holy Land and then went on a trip to Berlin and there encountered the, the life and, and work of Martin Luther, the reformer, and was so inspired by Luther that Michael King changed his name to Martin Luther King. He had a five-year-old son named Michael King Jr., whose name would also be changed Martin Luther King Jr. Now, those two men are heroes. They were both reformers. Martin Luther of Germany was, was revolutionizing the world theologically, and Martin Luther King Jr. was revolutionizing the world socially, demanding that we value uh, everyone who's been made in the image of God. So they have a lot in common, and one of the things they have in common is that they both were, were receiving fierce opposition. MLK Jr., of course, assassinated in Memphis, and Martin Luther of Germany was not assassinated, but he was an outlaw. They chased Luther. Um, he, at one time, took on an alias, Junker George. He, uh, he dressed up as a woman at one point to, to hide. He grew a beard a couple of times. He should have kept it. Looked really good on him. Um, and uh, hid in this castle, the Wartburg Castle, where he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and though it might be a little mythical legend, he uh, had an inkwell. This is my inkwell from the Wartburg Castle. And there are ink stains on the castle where Luther was translating the Bible into German, and he was throwing the inkwell at the devil, he said. Now, we don't know how, how true that story is, but it is very true that Luther encountered intense warfare. Not just from the Roman authorities, but from Satan himself. And you can hear that in that song, A Mighty Fortress, can't you? Well, I bring those guys up because they were not the only reformers in history. We're reading about a reformer named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is also, in chapter 6, receiving fierce opposition. Remember now, if you're new to our study, Nehemiah is written about, or the, the events take place some 400 years before the birth of Christ. God's people have re-entered into Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the temple, and now Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem in the first six chapters. And then in the, the rest of the book, as we'll start next week, it's about rebuilding the people, repopulating the city and building them up spiritually. So Nehemiah, in chapter 4, 5, and 6, is all about opposition. We have in chapter 4, the people receiving opposition, ridicule, threat. Chapter 5, we looked at last week, there was internal conflict, 
within the community as the rich were oppressing the poor. And now the opposition gets focused on Nehemiah personally. They're trying to sack the quarterback, if you will. And you know, in football, if you can take the quarterback out of the game, you have a good chance of winning. That's what they're trying to do with Nehemiah. They've given up on trying to attack the people. Now the assault is coming on Nehemiah himself. And it's coming through these particular individuals that we'll read about in a moment. But really, I think behind it is the work of the enemy. Now here's the thing. If you're a Christian and you set out on a holy ambition, which we're calling this study, and which I'm defining as doing something for the good of people and the glory of God, a holy ambition. If you have a holy ambition, you too will face opposition. You'll have all types of obstacles. The enemy itself will, will, will be after you. And so the question that I bring to chapter 6 now is how might you and I endure opposition? How might we endure the enemies, the schemes of the enemy, and press on faithfully? And this is what you learn from Nehemiah. But before I tell it to you, I want you to see this theme of fear. Notice if you've got a Bible and you're looking at it down in verse 9, these tactics that the enemy are, are using against Nehemiah are all kind of have a common thread, a common you know, uh, intent, and that is to frighten him. Verse 9, it says, For they all wanted to frighten us. Verse 13, For this purpose he was hired, that is a false prophet, that I should be afraid. Verse 14, he, he says he wants God to remember his enemies, Sambal and Tobiah, and he says at the end of that phrase, the rest of these false prophets who wanted to make him afraid. Very end of the chapter, verse 19, Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. What are these, trying to, what are these guys trying to do with Nehemiah? It's pretty obvious. They're trying to produce fear. They're intimidating Nehemiah. And this is exactly what the enemy wants to do to us. He wants to cripple us with fear. How does Nehemiah endure it? This is the big idea. Nehemiah endures the fear tactics of the enemy by having a greater fear of God. By fearing God supremely, you can endure the fear tactics of the enemy and press on faithfully. You remember what Jesus says in Matthew 10? He says, guys, listen, don't fear the person who can kill the body. Fear him who can, kill, who can put body and soul into hell. Don't fear them, fear me. If you have a proper perspective on who God is, a proper fear of God, then you can view every other enemy rightly, properly. And you see that they're really nothing in comparison to who our God is. You remember chapter 1, how it opens up. Nehemiah gives us his vision of God when he calls God our great and awesome God. He really believes that. And because he knows this great and awesome God, the little schemers here in chapter 6, they, they really do not deter him from his mission. If you can fear God, you'll see every other enemy rightly, and you can press on faithfully. It, it's uh, John Newton's old hymn, right? Amazing Grace. Newton says, Grace has taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears, plural, has relieved. Grace teaches us, the gospel teaches us who to fear. And I don't mean as a Christian that you're in terror of, of God, but that you revere him, you're in awe of him. Grace teaches us who we ought to fear. And grace our fears relieves. Proper fear of God, relieving all other fears. Put God in proper perspective, biblical perspective, then you can endure all these schemes. You with me? Four schemes in Nehemiah chapter 6. I want to show you. In each of them, you see Nehemiah responding out of this vision of God that he has. Okay? First scheme is uh, we'll call just deception. These guys try to lure Nehemiah to this meeting. Verse 1, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshub the Arab, these guys are like rocks in Nehemiah's shoe. He cannot get away from them. The rest of our enemies as well, when they heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. So it's a, the mission's almost complete. They've almost built this wall. They just need the gates. And the closer they get to, to completion, the closer they get to finishing the mission, the greater the opposition becomes. Verse 2, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come up and let us meet together at Hakafarim in the plain of Ono. Oh, oh no. Yeah, you, you knew it was coming. In the plain of Ono. 
Now, what are they wanting to do? This, it's a little political intrigue here. We want you to come up for this political summit, Nehemiah. Now, this had to be somewhat tempting because Ono is about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. It was a lush area. It would get him out of the rubble of the city. That would be nice. And it would put him in, the, you know, in relationship with the influencers, the political leaders of the surrounding places. This could have really pumped his pride up, his ego, you know? So like, hey, why don't you come up to Hakafarium in the plain of Ono? And you notice two responses from, from Nehemiah. The first is discernment. But they intended to do me harm. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Discernment comes from a proper fear of God. Wisdom comes from, from a proper sense of God. Nehemiah is alert. He's not mindless. He's not careless. Trusting in God doesn't mean we check our brain at the door. We ask God for wisdom, for discernment. He already understands that this is not a political summit. This is not a retreat. They intended to do me harm. Now, we don't know if they wanted to kill him. Did they want to kidnap him? Whatever the case, Nehemiah is exercising discernment here, and he says, oh, no, to oh, no. Now, notice the second thing he does in verse 3. He says, I sent messengers to them, which would have been a pretty dangerous job, wouldn't it, to be a messenger to the people who want to kill your, your boss? Um, I'd be like, why don't you send somebody else? But he sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. A great phrase in Nehemiah. Some of you moms might want to take this as a life verse for your kids as they continue to pester you all day long, asking you for one thing after another. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Okay? <laughs> it's a good one. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Add that sentence in as well. Why should I come down to you, little Johnny? I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. What's Nehemiah doing here? Well, he's, he's being resolved to finish his mission. He's staying focused on the task at hand, isn't he? He's not being diverted. So he's saying no to temptation and he's saying no to diversion. And my friends, we must do the same thing. We're taught in Titus chapter 2 that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldliness. Grace teaches us to say no. It's a very important word for the Christian. We say no to sin. We say yes to God. We say no to temptation. And we have to avoid being diverted from the things that are important. I mean, you, some people might read Nehemiah's response to these guys and say, well, that's rude. That's not very nice. He just tells these guys no. Well, sometimes you've got to tell people no, don't you? There's a difference in being available to people, to being a servant of people, and being a puppet of people. Nehemiah is not that. He's not enslaved to the approval of others. He, he's, he's not being driven by this desire for applause, but rather he's, he's being led out of calling. And so you and I also need to learn how to, to say no in certain contexts, to stay focused. Jesus had to do this. In Mark chapter 1, he'd been healing, he'd been teaching, and the disciples come to him and they say, the whole town's looking for you. And he says, let's go to the other town that I may preach. That's why I came out. Staying focused on mission. And what you see in all of this is Nehemiah living out of conviction, not guilt. This is very important for the Christian life. That you and I learn to live out of conviction, not out of guilt, out of trying to win the approval of others. Conviction comes from God. Guilt comes from people. And you'll be driven, won't you? By one of those two, at times you'll find great tension. Being driven out of conviction rather than guilt. Adults know this, but teenagers, this is a big one for you. This is discipleship for you. Will you cave into peer pressure, living out of guilt, wanting the approval of others, or will you live out of biblical convictions? Ladies, when the guy comes up to you and he's up to no good, singing Ed Sharon or whatever, you know, he loves the shape of you, and he's, he's smooth-talking sand ballot and... Uh, Tender Tobiah, when they make their play, gorgeous Geshem, <laughs> what will you do? Will you live out of conviction or cave in? You say no to oh no. That's what you need to do. Tell him you went to Imago Day. He's like, where's oh no? You say, well, that's part of the problem. You should be here. All right? Get a Bible and join us. Okay? Um, Nehemiah is giving us a great example of what you do when these schemers come along. Use discernment, stay focused. 
Say no to temptation, say no to diversion. Second lesson we learn here is about how to respond to slander. These guys move from this little political intrigue to let's just rip him apart publicly. It's a smear campaign. I mean, this is like straight out of today's headlines, what they do next. Notice verse 4. They sent, me le- they, they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them the same manner. In the same way, Sam Ballot, for the fifth time. Now, again, that's very important, how resolved Nehemiah is. A lot of people think you'll cave in if they just keep being pushy. No, for the fifth time, he said no. That's very, very instructive. They sent a servant to me with an open letter in his hand, and it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and, why, and that is why you are building the wall. Now, this sounds very official, doesn't it? Doesn't it? it says, in it is written, there is a report. What's your source? Oh, we got a report. We can't unveil our source. You don't have a source. It, it just, the whole thing sounds very, very official. And according to, notice verse 6, these reports, you wish to become their king. Well, where, where are your source from, man? Like, we should never get into that rumor game, should we? Like, he has no source. What is it, a hobbit? Is it an elf? Like, who's your source? You, you don't have a source. You're making all of this up. And what the, what are their, what are, what's their story? Nehemiah is doing all this because he wants to be the king and he wants to rebel. That's treason. That gets your head cut off. And it's all lies. It's a smear campaign on Nehemiah. Verse 7, and you have also set up prophets. You've got a whole staff to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. If you won't come to oh no, we're going to make this report known to the king. These guys are relentless, aren't they? Notice how Nehemiah responds in verse 8. First of all, he simply denies the charges. Then I said to them, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. Now, there's not a lot you can do when people have false reports about you and wrongly accuse you. Remember, Jesus said this would happen to disciples in Matthew chapter 5. He says people will utter all kinds of false things about you. Rejoice and be glad because they did the same thing to the prophets. All Nehemiah does here is simply deny it. He doesn't really spend a whole lot of energy trying to defend himself. He just simply writes, hey, this is not true. And then he does something very important. Verse 9. They all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. What does Nehemiah do? He prays. Slander, what do you do? Denies it categorically. Praise, there's not a whole lot more you can do. God, strengthen my hands. Again, this is one of these examples of Nehemiah praying. Now, notice this. Nehemiah doesn't pray, Lord, change this, but strengthen me. God doesn't always change our circumstance, does he? Paul prays, Lord, remove the the thorn. Does he? No, but he adds more grace. It's not change these guys, change the situation, but strengthen me. I would would submit this is the everyday prayer of a Christian, isn't it? Lord, strengthen me. And what you learn from Nehemiah is you can do it right in the heat of the battle. Whether you're in the car or you're in the kitchen, you're going to school. As one of my kids said yesterday, Papa, I pray all the time, Lord Jesus, keep me away from these wild women. (laughs) I hope he's telling the truth. And I hope the Lord hears his prayer. But you can, students, when you're in the midst of that pressure cooker of temptation, that cauldron of lust of, 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 of high school, strengthen me. Amen. Because we're weak, aren't we? We're vulnerable. We're human. We crack. Strengthen me. This is what the early church prayed in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. It says that they were threatened like Nehemiah, not because they were building a wall, but because they were preaching the gospel. And they didn't pray Remove this situation. They said, Lord, give us boldness. Consider their threats and grant us to speak your word boldly. And God heard their prayer. And he obviously heard Nehemiah's because Nehemiah is strengthened, isn't he? So my friends, learn to pray like Nehemiah. Constant communion with God. I've already said it, but 10 out of 13 chapters, this guy's praying. Matt Chandler says that when he goes home sometimes, he, when he pulls into the driveway, he prays that the Lord would grant him strength to minister be a good husband, a good dad, when he gets home because he's exhausted from being at the church office all day. Like we can't let our guard down, can we? 
all the time, Lord, strengthen us. As Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that we'd be strengthened in our inner being. Well, that's a really good lesson here we're learning. One of my heroes is Charles Simeon. I always think about Simeon when I get to this portion of Nehemiah. Charles Simeon became a pastor of Holy Trinity Church in 1782. He has a fascinating testimony. He was converted at Cambridge because they were going to take the Lord's Supper, and he didn't know anything about the Lord's Supper, so he read a book on it and got converted and didn't meet another Christian for a year. He then was appointed soon after to be the, the, the pastor of this pretty prestigious church. He was a very good preacher, but the people hated Simeon. Mid-20s. And so for 10 years, they locked the church pews. As back in the day, you know, your whole family had a little box. They locked them because they didn't want anybody to hear Simeon. He put some temporary chairs out in the aisles and they put them outside. And for 12 years, they wouldn't let Simeon preach the evening sermon. They had say over the evening sermon. A guest preacher preached. Simeon stayed for 54 years. Eventually won the approval of the people and has just a tremendous legacy of expository preaching and global missions. What was his secret? This man, by the way, who was single his whole life. 54 years. This is what his biographer says about Simeon's secret. Simeon invariably arose every morning, though it was the winter season, at 4 o'clock. Some of you didn't know God was awake at 4 o'clock. And after lighting his fire, he devoted the first four hours of the day to private prayer and the devotional study of the scriptures. Here was the secret of his great grace and spiritual strength. Deriving instruction from such a source and seeking it with such diligence, he was comforted in all his trials and prepared for every duty. Four in the morning. Strength. That's what Simeon needed. That's what Nehemiah needs. You can do it at four in the morning, 4 p.m. all day long. Some say, well, that's very legalistic. No, it's not. It's desperate. If you're desperate for strength, you cry out, don't you? And so, my friends, let's learn from Nehemiah. He is a bold figure. We're learning a lot from him. But he had feet of clay like us. His source of strength was from his great God. Third scheme here is the scheme of religious conspiracy. It intensifies now in verse 10 as they, they bring on a whole group of false prophets to scheme on Nehemiah. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mahedabal, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. How many of you been like, all right, that's enough. It's fight or flight. Either give me the sword, I'm going after these bozos, or give me a milkshake, I'm going to bed. Like, after so long, like, <laughs> I wonder if Nehemiah was just saying, guys, I'm a cup bearer, okay? Why is the contract killer coming after me? <laughs> All right, I'm not Jason Bourne, I'm Nehemiah. And now they've devised a plan to say, they're going to kill you. Now, notice what Shemaiah, this false prophet, wants Nehemiah to do. He wants him to go into the temple. Why is that a big deal? Nehemiah's not allowed to go into the temple. So not only would he be diverted from the task at hand, but he would be violating Scripture. So what they probably want to do by threatening Nehemiah is discredit him, make him a transgressor of the law, ruin his reputation, as he says down in uh, verse 13, to give him a bad name. How does Nehemiah respond? Verse 11. Notice what he says. But I said, should such a man as I run away? This is a man with courage. That's his first response. Courage. All through the scriptures we're told, do not fear, do not be afraid, fear not. And each time, almost every time, we see something about the character of God that comes behind that. For I am with you. For I am your God. That's where the courage comes from. Nehemiah believes that to cower in fear, excuse me, to cower in fear would, would be to say something about God, that he doesn't trust God, that God isn't trustworthy. Should such a man as I run away? No, he won't do it. But there's something else that I love in this section, and that is Nehemiah is committed to Scripture. He won't violate Scripture because this will be a, an easy way out. Notice his, his conviction. Next sentence. And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him. So again, there's discernment. But he had pronounced a prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired them. 
For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way, and here it is, and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. This is what Nehemiah fears. It's very important. He fears sinning more than dying. And my friends, when that is in your heart, that, that's an expression of a holy ambition. He fears violating Scripture more than their threats, more than dying. He fears offending God more than offending people. Why? Again, he's got the right fear. He has a healthy fear of God. He knows who God is. God says, you can't go into the temple. And by the way, in 2 Chronicles 26, you can read later, Uzziah had no business being in the temple. He was a king. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26 that he was, when he was strong, he grew proud. A very sobering verse. And out of his arrogance, he tried to offer incense in the temple, but he wasn't a priest, and God struck him with leprosy. Nehemiah says, no. This is what God has said. This is, this is how I'm going to live. And we've got to make our mind up, don't we? What do we fear? Who do we fear? He knew this whole thing was a sham. He knew what God had clearly said, and he feared sinning more than dying. Third response is prayer, verse 14. This is an interesting prayer. You may want to uh, offer some of these up. I don't know. A prayer of God take care of them, will you? Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God. Just put a little line under their name. Make sure they're in your book. Don't forget these cats. According to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. This is Nehemiah basically saying, God, vengeance is yours. We know on the last day you'll have the last word. Now, think about this for a moment. In verse 14, and then back in chapter 5, verse 19, twice, Nehemiah utters a prayer in view of judgment and reward. Again, that's living with a healthy fear of God. He says in verse 19 of chapter 5, Remember for my good, my God, what I've done for this people. Don't forget, because everything I'm doing is for you. And while people may not pay any attention to it, and while people's assessment is not always accurate, everything I'm doing, I'm doing it for your glory. And God, I also know that my critics, my objectors, the enemies, you'll have the last word on them. He lives with a great vision of God in life. And you and I have much to learn from him, don't we? In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, we're taught that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, writer gets to the end of the book and says, the end of the matter is this, fear God. The beginning, the end, fear God. That's how we live. We know who God is. We stand in awe of him. Everything we want to do, we do it for his glory. That's why Nehemiah is building this wall. It's not because he likes construction. And he's not doing it for the applause of people, to get on Oprah and talk about what a great wall he built. He's doing it for God's glory, isn't he? For the good of people. And he recognizes at the end, God will have the last word on these guys. So he can stay focused on the mission. That leads to scheme number four, internal pressure. Now the enemies decide to work from within the community. You would think at some point these guys just give up, but they don't. And this too is another lesson about the enemy, persistence. He doesn't stop, even after the victory. And that's very important for us to remember, that we are often vulnerable after victories. Nehemiah could have put his guard down. After the wall's built, he tells us about that wall in verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. Now, you'd expect a little bit more than that, wouldn't you, in verse 15? It's kind of non-dramatic. So we built the wall. It's, it's such a dude statement. How was your day, honey? That was good. What did you do? I built the wall. Well, tell me about it. 52 days. It was in Elul. We did it in Elul. Um, <laughs> some of you ladies know what I'm talking about. Dude won't talk. He's been home. And you haven't used your words yet. And you got a whole lot to unleash, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's just matter of fact. Yeah, we built the wall. Dude, you like left Persia, went to a lot of trouble. You've been dealing with these, these, these enemies. And the wall's built. We're, we're expecting exclamation points. We're expecting a party. We're expecting something exciting. Yeah, we built the wall. It's done. 
Now, I think the reason Nehemiah might be so non-dramatic here is that this is not all that Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is about. First half of the book's about building the wall. Second half of the book's about building the people. Much harder. And we'll get into that starting next week. So it's just a statement of fact. It happened in 52 days. It was remarkable. And it happens, and Nehemiah says in verse 16, with the help of God. He says, and when all our enemies heard of it, notice here, enemies are still present after the wall's built. When they heard it, they were afraid. They stood in awe. They felt greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So they understand, like, if this wall is built in just 52 days, God has to be on their side, and if that God is their God and we're their neighbors, we better look out. Nehemiah knows where the credit goes. It's with the help of God that he does it. And you notice verse 17, here's the last scheme. They begin to cooperate from within the community. So the wall's built, but the enemy's not stopping. 17, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. So they're communicating with this enemy. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and he was the son of Jehonan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakai, as his wife. And so what happens here is Tobiah is linked to the, the leaders, the, 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 uh, the wealthy, the influencers, financially and by marriage. So he's going to destroy, or seek to destroy, I should say, the community of faith from within by cooperating with influential leaders within the community. And this is often how churches are destroyed. So the enemy cooperates with people from within, how countries are destroyed, and in this case, how they're trying to destroy the community of faith in Nehemiah. Verse 19, Nehemiah's response. Also, they spoke of his good deeds. Oh, Tobiah is awesome and my presence, and reported my words to him. So there's correspondence going back and forth to the enemy. And Tobiah sent me letters to make me afraid. What does Nehemiah do? Well, it's not on the screen, but verse 1 of chapter 7. Now when the wall had been built, I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers and singers and the Levites, dot, dot, dot. Nehemiah keeps going. He doesn't stop in the face of these enemies. Chapter 7 is a list of the people who repopulate Jerusalem. It's a lot of names. It's like the Jerusalem phone book in chapter 7. And all of those names are important because what's happening in chapter 7 is he wants to repopulate Jerusalem with true Jews, which is quite significant because someone is going to come from this repopulated Jerusalem of pure Jews that's quite significant to us, namely Jesus. He keeps going in the face of enemies. Grace has taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. God's grace was upon Nehemiah, and as a result, he feared God more than the enemies. Now, I'd like for us to think about how we would summarize chapters 1 to 6. If you were to ask me, how would you summarize the first six chapters? I'm glad you've asked, guys. Really glad you asked. I, I actually have a little summary for you. Just five quick lessons. I won't elaborate on them, but you can tease it out later and just maybe go back if you've missed a few weeks. First of all, what do we learn about having a holy ambition in the first six chapters of Nehemiah? Opposition is inevitable. In this world, Jesus says you will have trouble. Ephesians 6, we've got to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. 1 Peter 5, the devil is prowling like a lion. Opposition is inevitable. Secondly, not only that, but sacrifice is inescapable. If you set out to do something for the good of people and the glory of God, it will require sacrifice, won't it? I mean, we can't overlook the fact that this was hard work. It takes work to accomplish something wonderful and beautiful for the good of people and the glory of God. Any leader, every leader knows this. You put your own skin in the game. Sometimes your own money in the game, right? Your own, your own home, like you're all in. Nehemiah is all in. It requires sacrifice. Thirdly, we see also from the first six chapters that teamwork is essential. Nehemiah is not the only guy in this story, is he? Next week we'll see the priest, the, the Bible guy, Ezra, my favorite chapter, chapter 8. Can't wait for next week. And it's a whole team. People are on the wall. People are building parts of the gate. That's the church now as we know it. Like everybody is important. We believe in the priesthood of all believers 
A very important theological emphasis in the Protestant Reformation, that we all have access to God, that we all serve and can serve to the glory of God. Teamwork, we find our place in the community, and we give, we serve. Fourthly, we learn from Nehemiah that prayer is effectual. That is, it works. Nehemiah keeps praying, Lord, strengthen me, and obviously God keeps responding. And finally, from Nehemiah 1-6, to we learn that God is invincible. These guys are no match to our God. He is the great and awesome God, and Nehemiah is showing us that his view of God is correct. He really is the great and awesome God. What you could hang over the first six chapters is the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, because God's faithfulness is on display. God promised as early as Genesis 3.15 that one is going to come from the seed of woman who will crush the head of the serpent. What are we seeing in chapter 7 as we glance into these names? That soon, some 400 years later, one will come from the seed of woman. He will crush the head of the serpent, namely Jesus. As Paul says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. God is faithful to his promise, and in due time, the son comes. And this Jesus also knew a thing or two about opposition, did he not? From the very moment of his birth, he received opposition. Herod wanted to kill him. His family thought he was crazy. People accused him of being in league with the devil. Openly slandered. Unjustly incriminated. Betrayed by his closest friends. Crucified on a cross. The closer he got to finishing the mission, the more the opposition became. The greater intensity became became the opposition. But Jesus, he didn't finish the wall. He finished the work outside the walls. And he rose from the dead. And what did he do by resurrecting from the dead? He has, my friends, alleviated our greatest fear. He has crushed our greatest enemy. And because Jesus has removed our greatest fear, namely death, we can view all other fears properly. All the other fears are like little flea bites compared to that one. And my friend, maybe you don't have it. Maybe you have it inverted. I would ask you, how are you going to beat death? That's the fear you should be concerned about. And there's only one way to beat that fear, and that is by trusting in the Savior, the one that came from this people, who lived the life we couldn't live, who endured all that opposition, who endured the wrath of the Father on the cross so that we don't have to, who rose from the dead as the vindicated, victorious Son of God, and now sets at the Father's right hand. That's the one we look to today. And that's where we find our strength in the midst of all of our fears, in the midst of all of our opposition. Listen how the author of Hebrews says it in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Perhaps this morning you are a bit weary, weary from opposition, weary from the struggles of life. The author of Hebrews says, Consider him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. My friends, consider him today, the Lord Jesus. That's what we're going to do now as we prepare our hearts for the table. May God grant us much grace. May grace, may grace teach our hearts to fear. And grace our fears relieved. We're going to have many dangerous toils and snares, aren't we? But the Lord will see us through because he is faithful. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for first loving us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one you promised to send and whom you did send, who lived, died, rose, and reigns, and will return. I pray that we would live all of life with a proper view of who he is, that we would not fear the enemy's tactics, but rather we would live with a sober sense of the lordship of Jesus Christ, the cosmic king. And we would realize that if God be for us, who can be against us. And we know that's true because you put forward your son, Father. You proved that you were for us at Calvary. I pray you would grant us fresh strength today as we try to live out a long obedience in the same direction. And we pray this in Christ's good name. Amen.